Hello, everyone, and thanks for coming. I wanted to let you know that there are some empty seats up front. Uh, <laughs> this, this really is meant to be a casual conversation. Um, I'm not sure how well that will work, um, but we're doing our best. Uh, I do sincerely thank you all for, for joining us and, the, um, yeah, and for taking time out of your lunch. I, I, it's, it's nice to stay out at lunch and talk to friends, but we're all your friends, right? Your ad hoc friends, your ad hoc family. So the, pur uh, the, the purpose today is to give you a really quick introduction of what ad hoc is, what it's about, and then to open the floor for uh, conversation. So I will start with a couple of uh, slides of introduction and then introduce you to the people. We have about one approximately one slide, four or five minutes each, so we should be done within half an hour, I think, and then uh, hopefully inspire some um, questions or complaints or suggestions, and we're taking notes and recording this, so we're taking it very, very seriously. So um, thank you very much. I wanted, for those of you who don't know, ADHO is an organization of constituent organizations. Here's a list of them uh, that until yesterday had 11, now it has 13. We're very, very happy to welcome the Korean Association. <laughs> Korean Association of Digital Humanities and the Digital Humanities Alliance for Research and Teaching Innovation, which is the um, DH organization of India. But we're also an organization of lots and lots of other organizations, special interest groups, boards, committees, officers. We have a common goal, and that is to promote the digital humanities. We have a little mission statement that was on the title slide and is on the first page of our website, uh, and you can see it here. This, uh, you're not meant to necessarily read all the fine print here. Uh, I included this so that you'd know that it's a complicated organization. Um, I, we seek to understand it ourselves and to make it better and more streamlined, but it's uh, complicated for some very good reasons. Another um, important consequence of its complicatedness is that there are lots and lots of open positions all the time and lots of opportunity to get involved. And I will confess that I always have seen this event and other similar ones that we've done as recruitment tools. That hasn't worked very well, so maybe I should stop doing it. But I still want to invite you all, if you've taken the time out of your lunch to come join us, Maybe you are ripe for a committee assignment or you want to be an officer in ADHO, and we would welcome you, your interest. You or people that you care about that you would like to see um, visible in the community. So the Constituent Organizations Board and the Executive Board of ADHO, we call them the COB and the EB. Uh, sometimes we call ourselves the COB Web, COB with EB, um, because of the pace of work. Um, meant to be tongue in cheek, not everyone really gets that, uh, but I like it. Um, these are our current officers or cha and chairs. About um, a third of us are up here on the stage and several others are in the audience. Um, so I, it's been a pleasure to serve with uh, all of these people. Um, several of us are, have terms that are ending at the end of the conference. Uh, we all are grateful for the people who are coming in to replace us. And uh, once again, you all are welcome to come in and replace them in their turn. It really is an organization that requires lots of, uh, lots of input and lots of help. So are you one of our next ad hoc committee members or officers? Please say yes. Susan, uh, who is the outgoing chair of the COB, will now talk about some of the COB and EB initiatives over the past year. All right. Uh, thank you for coming, folks. It's always a big pull, especially when we haven't been together for so long between the, the mingling in the, in the lobby and uh, and the session, so thanks for being here. So in uh, the summer of or June 2020, shouldn't uh, one of the things I've learned from ADHO is try, to try not to refer to things by seasons because they, of course, vary around the globe. But in June of 2020, of course, uh, many organizations started thinking hard about uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion. Um, ADHO put out a statement on Black Lives Matter, uh, structural racism, and establishment violence in which we committed to a number of things in terms of trying to uh, promote inclusion. And this was not a new thing. There had been calls for greater diversity within ADHO for years, and we were already working on it in a range of ways, but as for many other organizations and individuals, it sort of catalyzed our sense of the urgency of the situation. Um, so in that, we made, in that statement, we made a commitment to, to nine things that we would work towards. And so I'm just going to report briefly on those things and uh, talk about how we'll be moving forward on them. 
So we first of all tried to engage a, a paid external consultant, along with every other organization in the world at the time. Uh, and we had pretty special needs in that the kind of um, racism that we needed to address and, and other forms of discrimination that were uh, important to combat um, were not just located in one area of the world or in one culture or in one linguistic group. They spanned the globe. And so we needed an organization with real awareness of the ways that uh, these uh, problems differ from place to place. And we could not uh, find, we, we had trouble getting bids in the first place and the bids that we did get uh, did not match our, our needs. We didn't think we would get anything useful out of it. So we kind of pivoted to number two, our second priority, which was to create an anti-racist, anti-discriminatory ta discriminatory task force to follow up on um, the external review that we hoped the consultants would do. And we asked that task force uh, to work with us to do the review and help us create the plan. And that what led to the formation of uh, what was uh, came to be named the Intersectional Inclusion Task Force, which formed a little over a year ago and has a mandate for two years. The first year has been uh, sort of exploratory and figuring out how to work together and how, how to engage with ADHO, um, during which time they have really provided very valuable input in a range of ways on uh, things that we were doing. And then phase two next year, we'll uh, see closer collaboration between the uh, Cobb and the executive board and the IITF to move forward on uh, developing a, a more coherent plan. Um, but in the meantime, we've actually made progress on quite a number of the other priorities. So um, the third one had to do with the conference, reviewing the conference and figuring out how to ensure fair treatment during peer review um, and also to promote diverse content. Um, and we have done a lot of work on the conference this year. Um, again, there was lots of stuff in the works before, but the uh, article in Digital Humanities Quarterly, that was a sort of retrospective review of the conference by a number of program committee chairs thinking hard about equity, diversity, and inclusion was again a kind of push to us to say, okay, let's really grapple with as much of this as we can. And we made a number of changes um, that uh, you'll hear about more from from Christoph in a moment. Um, we also said that we'd create a process for gathering data on um, things like uh, the conference, publications, the makeup of committees, and so on. And uh, Diane Jakaki has put together a data analysis working group that's basically going to try and figure out how can we collect more useful data, because the data we have is not very good for our purposes. So we need to be more intentional going forward to collect uh, data in a way that will support these efforts. Um, the, the sixth priority was to create a social media policy to ensure inclusive representation in the, in, in the content on the social media accounts and the website. That is done, and I have to say the communications team has been marvelous uh, taking on board this mandate. Uh, it's not only embedded in the policy and the practices, but we will, by the end of the year, as I said in the opening, be launching the website in uh, two other languages, French and Spanish, uh, and there's... Um, you know, a new chair coming in for the Multilingualism and Multiculturalism uh, Committee who is very committed to, you know, expanding the activities of, of that committee in some really fabulous ways. So I think we're going to see a lot of really great um, movement on uh, and, and sort of expansion and careful thinking about the language policy because, of course, our languages are getting more and more diverse as, as our membership grows. Um, and uh, lastly uh, was um, a, a sort of vaguer thing about diversifying leadership through mentoring. And I, I would say tentatively that I really think this is happening already when I look at who is um, volunteering for ADHO and the makeup of our committees and people coming into new positions. I think we are seeing uh, a diversification that is extremely welcome. I think we can do more in this area and we will, but um, I would say our efforts so far are um, not as swift as we would like, but we had a pandemic to deal with. Uh, and um, I'm really, really heartened to see how we are sort of normalizing. We're not segregating diversity into a particular committee. It's happening across all of these different areas of the organization. Everybody takes it seriously, and that is what we need. So thanks. Did you want to mention your identity project? 
Pardon? Oh, yeah, right, the Identity Project. Yes, thanks so much. Uh, so Quinn Dombrowski, who I saw here, right there, uh, second row, purple hair, you can't miss her, uh, is, um, you know, part of the, the conclusion of the restructuring process was um, a realization that we sort of need to ask who we are now. We have restructured in a very significant way and, you know, part of our restructuring, you know, it was basically, as I said uh, last night, it was an, inclus it was an inclusivity uh, initiative from the beginning to expand the organization. And now we really have to think about, like, who we are now coming out of that. And Quinn has uh, mounted this identity project, which started with consulting with CEOs and is now going to uh, launch a survey of everybody at the conference and beyond the DH community generally to ask you who is ADHO for and what should it be doing. So there's going to be a blog post going up on the website in the next day or two, and please, it'll be a short survey, we promise, not one of these ones that you know makes you sit down for half an hour with a cup of coffee, but brief and to the point. Uh, so please uh, plan to, to uh, fill that out. Thanks. Okay, um, so I'm Melanie Conroy, the um, deputy treasurer and um, the incoming treasurer. Um, I just want to talk quickly about um, the finances um, of ADHO, and I think it's important because, um, you know, in, in some ways, you know, this is where we're really um, showing our values. Um, and so um, I also want to focus on ways that you can get involved in some of our transparency efforts um, for us to, you know, help other people understand um, our finances. Um, so we have um, two main forms of income. Um, subscriptions to and profits from shared publications. Um, and that's the majority of our um, income. Um, so that's um, something that is obviously sustained by, sustained by all of your research efforts, right? So these things maybe start as a conference paper, um, you know, and then develop into publication. And that's really, um, you know, all of that excellent work of the research community is what really drives our income. Um, but we have a new um, sort of way to diversify our income, um, which is that um, we are looking more at membership fees. Um, so obviously, um, coming to the conference, I'm assuming most of you, um, you know, registered as a member of a CO of a constituent organization. Um, so ultimately, really, um, that additional source is coming from your membership fees. Um, so for that reason, of course, we want to um, represent the digital humanities community. Um, but that really happens through um, the constituent organizations. Um, and so it's really important to get involved with those organizations because they have a say on the ad hoc portion of the budget. Um, they vote on it, that's where the democratic um, you know, aspect of the budget comes in, but also because they themselves may have um, some you know, monies that they can allocate and that um, is something that the digital humanities community can benefit from. Um, the conferences um, strive to be cost neutral, um, so um, as much as we all know conferences are getting more expensive around the world and this being, you know, a global conference, um, you know, it, it can be, um, you know, a hefty move to come here. Um, but uh, in general, um, ADHO is not normally making money from the conference and we are, um, you know, as much as possible you know, seeking all that sort of income to go back into the conference experience um, for people. Um, and so in terms of getting involved, um, as I mentioned, it's really important to um, look at your constituent organizations and say, you know, which one reflects the priorities that I have. Um, and so if there's something that you'd like to see um, either reflected in the conference or reflected in some kind of digital humanities activity, really the first place to go get um, your voice heard is through one of the constituent organizations. Um, and then there is also um, a much smaller <laughs> budget um, for the, um, the SIGs, the special interest groups. Um, so that's another place, um, you know, they have a small budget to um, potentially do activities at the conference or, you know, other things that are valuable to their, their group. Um, and then also they can, uh, uh, the constituent organizations or um, the SIGs can, um, they can uh, encourage ADO to uh, undertake other projects on an annual basis. And so um, even if you do have an idea for something like that, it's really important to identify that special interest group or that constituent organization that would 
um, you know, be uh, the group where you would kind of get your first sounding board and then um, actually propose that to Adho. Yep, all the way over. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, as far as data goes, uh, this is a challenge we've been um, uh, working with for um, longer than I've been associated with ADHO, which feels like forever. Uh, it's not. Um, in terms of how, you know, the perception of what, what data ADHO gathers and has available and is able to share with the, um, the larger digital humanities um, community. Um, and I think to some, and I, and I understand and respect this, to some we seem like data gatekeepers, um, and we need to understand and be able to articulate and uh, communicate about what that means and why that might feel the way it does. Um, I think there are two particular challenges that we have as we're looking forward to really diving in and thinking about how we can uh, gather and curate and what data we can share, and the first is that you know, you might hear it often, but it's important to remind everybody that ADHO has no members, right? The COs have members, and therefore the, the information about membership has, sits with the, the, the constituent organizations. Um, where we are able to look at, at information is when the constituent organizations share it with us, or in cases like the conference. And so, um, I think the second challenge is that that kind of information, which is um, gathered through the conferences year after year, is, is very personal in nature, right? When you think about how you sign into ConfTool or how you register for the conference, a lot of that information is not what you want to be shared uh, with the broader world. And in fact, we are not allowed to um, legally. So. Um, while in the past, colleagues of ours like Scott Weingart and many others have attempted to find ways to communicate some parts of the, the information that comes out of these uh, conferences, we need to think intentionally about what is, share, what is gatherable, what then can be considered, and then from that, what subset of that information can be shared and, and carefully and respectfully and legally. Um, I think the second challenge for us is that we've got, how long is at home slash the 2000 and, uh, 2006, but before that it was in that. So there are decades of, of information um, in all forms, you know, um, records and um, communications and documents that, that uh, need to be carefully curated and archived and put into repositories so that they can remain a record of what has happened. And so a lot of what we're thinking about in this uh, group, which is made up of a, a small, uh, Melanie, you're a part of the group, um, and there are a couple of others as well, um, and uh, you're part of the group. Yay, it's, it's meant to be an agile, and IITF has a representative on the group. It's meant to be agile and nimble, um, but we're thinking very seriously about how we collect information, how we normalize that collection, or how we make sure it's sustained from year to year, um, how we are uh, proper stewards of that, that data, what, what that means, because I think that's a, a responsibility that we take very carefully. Um, and, um, how we make sure that any, get any information that we have access to um, is, is um, shared in ways that it can um, be of service to the, the equity and diver diversity and inclusivity um, um, statements and, and commitments that we've made, um, but that um, understand that we are looking for ways in which we can communicate with you through information and any suggestions you have, never, never feel like we're not listening. Please um, share with us what it is you want to know about the, the information, and we'll see how we can communicate that. And if we can't, we'll explain why. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks again. So I would like to talk a little bit about the conference, uh, which is obviously uh, the, the major event of the year uh, for ADHO and for the community. Um, so. The conference may seem to kind of just happen the way it always has, but it is, of course, shaped uh, by a number of protocols, of groups of people, and of technologies. And I'd like to make some of that a little bit more transparent and, and also explain some of the recent changes uh, we made to this, to this pretty complex setup. 
So it's pretty obvious that the local organizers and the program committee, that they are important and they are maybe um, more visible than other factors, but there's indeed uh, a lot more to this and uh, I will just list it and then I will give a few, uh, indicate a few changes we made recently to this, to this setup. So there's the conference coordinating committee, uh, so its members coordinate and manage the whole process of the conference. There's a call for hosts and it's published three years before the conference for which the, the call is, is issued. So there's a long time lapse that, that sometimes uh, makes changes slower than we would like them to be, but it's simply necessary to have this kind of timeline. Um, there's a conference protocol that defines roles and obligations, for example, the language policy. There's a call for papers, obviously, that defines the formats uh, for submission. There is a number of guidelines for authors, reviewers, presenters, and chairs. Um, there are, of course, the review criteria in ConfTool. They shape the reviewing process. Uh, there are keywords in ConfTool for reviewers, reviewers and for submissions, and they are used to match up reviewers and submissions. And there's the submission and abstract publication process uh, um, used uh, for, for, uh, for the publications. And so we made quite a few changes over the last year uh, to all of these uh, different uh, factors affecting the conference in response uh, to ongoing discussions, long-standing discussions uh, within ATO, in response also to the impulses that we received over the last year, um, and, um, and guided um, by, uh, by our desire to make the conference uh, support diversity, openness, and fairness better, uh, better and better. Um, so some of these changes, uh, uh, just very quickly, um, the conference protocol has been changed and will be changed more, uh, for example, to better define the minimum degree of hybridity that we want to um, expect. The conference coordinating committee has been changed to a smaller group, um, just three officers, uh, to be more agile and efficient. The call for proposals has been changed uh, um, by adding information on the uh, open peer review process. The call for hosts has been changed to invite bidders to propose innovative formats or other innovations in the conference to be considered and discussed to give a bit more flexibility and leeway uh, to bidders. Um, there are also changes that are basically in the works um, and that, um, that, that will be coming soon that are in preparation. For example, we are aware that we should rethink the language policy once again to better account for the fact that ADHO has members around the globe and that, um, for example, with the recent addition um, of DATI and KADH from Korea and from India uh, to also account uh, for that in our language policies. Um, the abstracts uh, for the conference have been published on Zenodo with separate landing pages and DOIs for the first time. That's another change. Um, and um, yeah, we, we do know that we, we, need to do, 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 we need to do something about the DH Convalidator that we all love. Um, but you know, we, we, we know this. Um, we're on it, but it's difficult. Um, so, and if you want to learn more about all of this, uh, please see our recent blog post on adhow.org slash news. And if you want to participate in shaping the conference, you can do that right now um, until the end of the month by proposing feedback on the revised review criteria um, in a survey that is also uh, that you can also find under adho.org news. That's for me. Thanks. Great, thank you all. Um, th this is the time for feedback. Uh, I wanted before we start the feedback, or as, a, as an introduction to the feedback, in addition to my pitch for you all to volunteer with the organization to help carry the workload, I wanted to let you know that despite our large and complex organization, it really is a, an organization that belongs to all of us, and the best way to make change is to, is to make change. Uh, if we, having served for a long time on these committees, I, I can attest that change really happens, but it only happens if individuals who care about it um, make their voices heard and their service heard. Did I forget something? Nope. Okay. I just wanted to say that you were about to say if people have questions, or you already did, um, we're also monitoring questions that are in the chat. So I'm telling people on the chat, if they have questions, we're monitoring you, so please ask. Very good, very good. So um, I will, I, I guess I'll stay standing up so I can see people. Uh, oh, and we have the, the box mic going around, so. Yes, and we have somebody taking notes, uh, our, our wonderful secretary, Megan Sensony, down here, so please introduce yourselves if you are comfortable doing that, and I see a first question right in the middle. Yeah, introduce yourself so we can follow up with you if you'd like. Thank you. 
So hello, I'm Sefi Dalesi from University of Basel, Deutsch Lab. So my question is, if someone volunteers to get involved in the at home, what is the workload? So for, from your experience, how much workload. time do you have to invest? I, I'll start. I would say that it absolutely depends which position, of course. Um, all of us are full-time full -time employed, and what we do is in spare time or release time. Uh, on the, the governing committees, on the executive board, um, some offices meet once a week for about an hour, and sometimes there's homework uh, with that. Most of the, the larger part of the board, uh, the committee chairs, et cetera, et cetera, meet once a month for an hour. And uh, around conference time, things get busier, of course, and we dedicate um, several hours a week. Um, I don't think more than 10, but depends on what's going on. Depends on what fires have to be put out. <laughs> yeah. Our secretary works uh, 80 hours a week. No, she doesn't really. Uh, uh, so those are, those are the, I mean, the people that you see here have done about that uh, amount of work. Committee members, which is a really, really easy way to, to contribute. They have a much lighter workload. They meet occasionally, more frequently around the conference. It depends how much, um, the, the, the pace of, of work during the conference year. So the awards committee, for example, has two big categories of award. They're the big awards, the lifetime achievement type awards. That's a process that happens once a year, and it'll be a few weeks of intense work, and that's it. During the conference, we have student, we have, um, uh, student bursaries and the Fortier Prize, the, the, the um, ones that uh, prize for the best presentation by, uh, by someone new to the field. That work is, has a burst of activity right during the conference. But it's really uh, several hours a week max for most people for most of the year. So Megan is, has been trying to f like help determine um, how we can better share the information. Do you want to speak for yourself? OK. Uh, Hi. Um, I'm the. Uh, executive board secretary, so I've been sitting here taking notes. Um, but one of the things I've been working on through the spring is putting together a survey of all past committee chairs and officers from, I think we wanted to go back five years, to get some of this exact information about what the uh, labor and dedication has been so we can communicate that better at the point of advertisement and to create um, much more structured position descriptions so that when we start to um, you know uh, go around looking for our next round of volunteers when we post new advertisements we can provide this information um, more transparently that, I think, is probably going to go through the fall. It, it takes a little while to get the survey quite the way we want it. And then, um, you know, digging up all the emails of everyone who's ever served is, is the next step that I think we're at right now. So look out for that. But I think that's something we can report on next year. And that'll probably end up as a blog post, I would imagine, and something that we would link to every time we publish a call for officers. But really, there is an ongoing need for committee members and and, and officers. At the moment, uh, this isn't, at the moment we could use uh, an assistant secretary. Uh, I'm sorry, yes, yes, a, a co-secretary, that hasn't been posted yet, and a, a co-treasurer, which has been posted. Um, so, uh, yes, uh, m most, of our, uh, most of our offices recently we've changed to a model where there are two people serving with staggered terms. So the, the first year or so of most terms will be an incoming kind of deputy person who shadows, who attends all the meetings, has a voice, but doesn't have to bear full responsibility. And then the, that, the senior person would uh, exit at the end of the term and the other person would come in. Uh, that's been a really good model, a really mentoring model. Um, and in addition to that, I wanted to add that even, uh, even jobs like a secretary or treasurer, which seem like requiring highly specialized skills, anyone who's at this conference has the skills to do those things. If you can use a spreadsheet, uh, you can be the treasurer. And um, Melanie's a great example of that. When um, she had volunteered for a position that had just been filled, and I said, ah, oh, we really need a treasurer. Can you do a spreadsheet? And she said, I don't know. And she's great. So, uh, 
So please, please consider even the ones that may not be in your, um, in your primary area of specialization. Did that answer the question? Do you have more? Yeah. Hi. So there was, uh, I'm Andy Janko. There was mention of the DH convalidator, mm -hmm. which I know that we've all uh, interacted with in some form or another, but I don't know that any of us know the story of where it came from, and uh, maybe this is a question to Christoph, but um, just like, what is it about? Where did it come from? I'm curious. <laughs> I can give some um, background if you want. <laughs> yeah, so, so Glenn may be able to... Uh... Let me give some deep background, and then Christoph will tell. The, when I hosted this conference in 2011, the, there always has been a requirement that we, that we maintain our conference abstracts in TEI, in very, very simple TEI. In 2011, uh, we realized, I'm sure this had been realized before and after, but we realized what how difficult it was to get the community to submit things in TEI, and if they submitted things in another format, in Word or even PDF, God forbid, but it happened, we were stuck, our organizing team was stuck converting all of those things to TEI ourselves, hundreds and hundreds of abstracts. So uh, in response to that, not necessarily to our particular 2011 conference, but everyone was experiencing it, a group in Germany said, there's a better way to do this, we will create this tool that makes it easier on, we'll push the work on TEI markup back onto the community, but we'll, we'll make it easier on the local organizers to do that. Uh, and thus, TEI, the, the convalidator was born. Um, yeah, that was, the purpose was to make things easier, but. Well, I mean, this is really most of the background of the story, yeah. so thanks, Glenn, uh, for uh, that. I mean, so yes, the idea was to make uh, it easier to produce um, both HTML, PDF, and XML versions, and the XML versions are just essential uh, for the record and to, to maintain structured, uh, I mean semi-structured and uh, machine-readable versions of, uh, of the conference abstracts, uh, basically to document the history of the field. And so the convalidator seemed like a really good idea uh, at the time, um, and it has served uh, as well, I think, on the whole. Um, we all know that it's a lot more complicated than it should be for users, and something that the users may not realize is that it's still also pretty complicated for the local organizers uh, to, um, to obtain clean XML TI that really supports the automatic conversion process and production of the book of abstracts afterwards. So it's unfortunately not perfect either for users nor for, um, for, the, uh, for, the, um, for the local organizers. And also the, the technology has moved on and shifted and so we are trying to come up with alternative um, ways of, of doing the same, of obtaining the same result, but making it easier for, for everybody involved. And this could involve um, markdown-based uh, submission systems that could, that could in, uh, involve um, online editors. And by the way, for Lausanne, the Lausanne uh, organizers um, created a tool called DH Writer that was an online editor uh, that also produced um, XML TI. Um, but it was not sufficiently sustainable, uh, so it didn't, uh, it didn't get carried on, and um, we continued with DH Convalidator again. But we have experimented also, I mean, we're using DH Convalidator also in the, in the German association, the DHD association, and in this context, we have also started to experiment with alternatives to it, um, but it's not an easy process when you don't have, you know, the, the, there's no project, there's no money, there are no, no people, we could just uh, tell to develop an alternative. Yeah. I would also add, while the microphone's being passed, that those of us who work in text in DH know that not only is it not an easy process, but it's a deeply complicated thing, right? And it's, it's possible that DH Convalidator makes it more complicated now than it has to be, but, but it, this is a fundamental truth about text that the, big, that the world doesn't really understand. So. So a meta answer is that this is a way in which we can demonstrate that we have pretty good communication through the local organizers and the PC chairs with the community because the local organizers came to us on Sunday and said this was a problem for us. Like, it, like here is the magnitude of this issue. And it was the first time we'd heard that, that clearly. I mean, we'd heard rumblings. You know, we've all had those experiences. But in fact, this was a very powerful statement that something needed to be done. And so, you know, this is a moment where we actually can take action because we understand statistically um, from people who have had to experience the pain, not as individuals, but as people who are like managing the process, 
you know, what needs to be accomplished. And I think this is a time for us to, to address that. Okay. Here we've got. Uh, we have a Brian over here in the middle. And while the microphone's going to Brian, I should say that we didn't introduce Michael Sinatra. Go ahead, uh, straight down in the yellow shirt, middle. Uh, it's Brian. <laughs> Go ahead, Brian. We'll turn over to Michael when you're done. Hello. I knew it. I'm Brian Croxel. Um, the, the talk of the convalidator made me think of something that maybe could be added to the protocols is the question of citations. I was surprised this year to be asked to put things in a citation format I'd never heard of. Um, I don't know if people outside of the US use the Harvard style, but that was not a, when I read that in the instructions, that was weird. Um, I didn't know there was a Harvard style. And so, if nothing else, we should have a style guide uh, or a link to such a thing when we're doing these references, or maybe we could use CLS, um, citation, um, no, CML, citation markup language, right? Like, there's no reason we couldn't, like, how could we plug Zotero or some other tools into this to do that? Because so, that is actually some of the hardest work, and yet the most important for making our citations known for other people. So, do you want to? Yeah. Thanks, Brian. That's, that's Thanks good. a lot, Brian. For, oh, do you want to? No, no, no. Okay, thanks a lot uh, for that um, for that impulse. Uh, yeah, I think we, we know that. Um, and again, in, in the German uh, community, we have shifted to Chicago for this. But the real um, <laughs> a Chicago and yes. Um, but I think the 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 real change we should make is is as you said, either um, uh, integrate Zotero in this workflow or integrate BibTeX into this workflow, so that uh, people just don't have to worry about this um, at all. Um, they still have to worry about clean data and complete data input. Um, so it's not, you know, there's always something. Uh, but that would be uh, a considerable progress, I think, and would also produce more useful data, uh, of course, because the data in the XML output that we have now is weakly structured and is not, you know, it doesn't follow any bibliographic standard. It's a type of graphic structurization of the, of the bibliographic in entries. So there's lots of room for improvement there as well, and, and we are aware of it. Thanks. Would I to push? Ah, there we go. D sorry, Dan, looks like you were going to say something. No? I, I was going to, I've got a question, but it looks like you were going to respond before I change topic. I honestly don't remember. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, great, okay, then changing topic back to, to um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, so obviously those are extremely important um, for you know, wherever you are in the world, and really, really important that ADHO ensures that that's something that you know, all the things that we're doing, those are taken into account. But the context under which they operate vary wildly, right, kind of globally. Is there a risk um, that both, I think, in in aggregating information on the one hand, or setting global, or attempting, as it were, for ADHO to set global policies, that we lose some of that context in, in important ways? And to what extent do you already, or should the individual constituent organizations be taking on kind of some of that work? Because of course, they're, they're closer to, you know, much better place to understand what those contexts are in their, in their, their various regions. Thanks for that. Um, yeah, you've put the, your finger on the tension there that we, we need to respect and, and celebrate local diversity and local conditions as part of our efforts at inclusion and diversity. And that means that I think there will always have to be uh, um, flexibility in the policies that we develop and a recognition that there is no one size fits all uh, approach or a set of regulations or or solutions, um, and in fact, one piece of the Black Lives Matter uh, uh, commitments that I didn't dwell on was the fact that we need to liaise with uh, affiliated organizations to do this work, and COs, constituent organizations, are obviously one of the big ones, and a number have uh, engaged in 
uh, diversity initiatives of their own in the wake of, of June 2020. And one of my recommendations as outgoing president in my report, which talks more about these things, will be going up online um, as, we, as we do with president's reports. So there's, there's more to read there in the future. But um, one of my suggestions was that we start talking to those organizations that have engaged in initiatives about what they might do and, and get a dialogue going there. Um, Another uh, type of related organization that we really need to liaise with is, is our publications. So we are very closely connected to uh, a number of publications, uh, Digital Scholarship in the Humanities, uh, the DH uh, Quarterly, um, uh, and, and a number of other journals that are actually subsidized by us. And yet they all have their own systems gathering data from them to sort of try to assess how, you know, um, uh, you know, demographics work among authors and so on w would be quite a challenge. So I think it's going to be one of the thornier areas for the data analysis group because, as Diane said, we control ConfTool and we can add questions to ConfTool and get people to sign off on the use of the data and so on. It's going to be much more complicated when it comes to publications. Um, but I think the flip side of that is that we will get insights from those different quarters into, into how we can... Um, approach the, the challenge. I, mean, I think it's going to be um, an, an ongoing process and, and dialogue and hopefully ADHO does continue to grow and with every new constituent organization we will learn more. For instance, um, Darty's own constitution, when we looked at it in the process of, of reviewing their application, I think uh, showed us some ways in which we could start to build some kind of accountability around demographics into our own governance structures because they have such a diverse uh, population in uh, the Indian subcontinent and, and within India that they've thought really carefully about how to advance underrepresented groups within their own uh, processes. I have another response to that. Thanks, Lee, for it. Um, I've heard many times in ADHO the importance of a diversity of diversities. So one consequence of us having a, a really large international community is that we aren't all the same and our differences are substantial. Uh, we, there are human differences and social differences and political differences, and it's great that those are big problems because otherwise our profession would be meaningless, right? If it was easy, we wouldn't have to have, have humanities at all, right? We could, whatever. Uh, uh, as every step we've taken in ADHO to um, everything from introducing the code of conduct, which is uh, about 10 years old, I think, to um, uh, um, making our Black Lives Matter statement, which as you all know, stemmed from a very particular set of circumstances in the United States, but the United States doesn't rule the world in spite of what you may have heard or, or be hearing. And uh, the ad hoc community uh, is, has been pretty good, especially lately, about letting the United States know that it doesn't, uh, or, or the, the US organization. Uh, and so the, the, time, uh, the time of the US or the, or the US and the Canadians and the Europeans having uh, their differences of opinion rule the world those two, different, those two sets of opinions, which as many of us know are, have distinctions, they also don't rule the world, right? We, it's a very, very big world, and so the diverse, diversity of diversities is really important. And Leif, I think you're absolutely right that the COs have that um, not only practical implementational responsibility, but also the cultural responsibility to take on some of this work. And yet, all at the same time, we do want it, we do think of ourselves as one one big family. We all come into a space like the conference space, and we have to we have to have shared, genuinely shared uh, opinions about conduct, about uh, political stances, appropriateness of behavior, uh, and and about diversity, equity, and inclusivity. So that it's always a tension. It's an interesting and healthy tension. Uh, but yeah, everyone has a part to play. Yeah. Um Nerdy, nerdy comment, or sort of. Um, it's easy to fall into traps when we're looking at information. Um, and one of the ones that I fell into this year was when we were looking at um, information about participants and reviewers and uh, uh, submitting authors that were in ConfTool and looking at the country in which, from which the authors hailed and assuming that the country in which, from which they hailed was the country that they are from, right? So, so where you are employed does not equate with your nationality or your understanding of your identity in a national context. And so I think that is one of the things we have to, when we're talking about, you know, EDI, we need to remember that we can't 
collapse in any way the information that we understand about anyone. And so we need to, to kind of think laterally about our own assumptions of, you know, well, who is working in a particular country and what does that mean about their relationship with that country? Or CO, because CSDH. Yes. Uh, we have a question in the middle and a question back uh, right. Hello, <clears throat> my name is Serenity Sutherland and I'm from SUNY Oswego, uh, the State University of New York. My question is thinking about the Alliance of Digital Humanities Organizations from the individual perspective and how an individual can think of this as a value. And one value is obviously the conference as we're seeing, but the conference is very expensive to attend and can be very far away. I also see that you offer the newsletter and podcasts, which seems like a great value as well. Um, one value I was hoping you might talk about a little bit more is how individuals can connect with other individuals in these other organizations uh, to find collaborators, to find um, just different perspectives. Uh, being new to the organization, I don't really know what avenues might be open for those kinds of individual connections. That's a great question, and I'll start with an start. I want me to start. So uh, really, everything happens in Adho through the constituent organizations, and there is one for you. You can join any of them. In fact, I'm a member of several of them. But the, the organization for you in New York City, in, in New York, sorry, um, is ACH, probably, the Association for Computers and the Humanities. And uh, one particular value of that uh, organization, and uh, Quinn is a president, she can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think a major value is as uh, accessibility and, and inclusivity and affordability, all sorts of accessibility. And ACH has uh, a, a fairly new series of virtual conferences that are um, not free, but very, very inexpensive and accessible. So that's one way. There are um, non ad hoc affiliated organizations that sort of bubble up from the ad hoc community. They don't have or need our endorsement, but many of them are fellow travelers and known to us. Uh, so I think this is not a great answer, but just ask around. Definitely. But start wait, there. there's more. A better one. <laughs> a better one. Great. <laughs> so there are how many uh, special interest groups? Ten, Ten. right now um, that are in various uh, degrees of activity, but they're more methodological and identity-based, I guess I would describe them as being disciplinary, yeah. disciplinary yeah. Um, and, and not necessarily geographically centered. And I think those are really rich um, opportunities for people who have a particular um, uh, context in which they work or, or do research in DH or what. Yeah, no, go ahead. What? I'll just add to what you're saying. Okay, um, that's all. Oh. Just to add on to what Diane was saying, I think if you're looking for a really lightweight way to get involved in ADHO, SIGs are great. There's quite a number of SIGs that would really welcome you with open arms because they, you know, a, a first generation got them started and those people have become busy and are wanting to um, uh, see, you know, some, some uh, new folks come in and stir things up and present new ideas. SIGs have some... Uh, uh, priority in terms of getting things into the program. They can propose workshops. They also have a uh, budget, as you heard earlier, allocated to them. So they have some resources for uh, doing things. And um, they're, they're self-organizing. So there's not a lot of bureaucracy associated with them. So you can find a list of them and contact information on the website. Uh, so take a look and see if there's something you're interested in, because they're precisely about cutting across uh, the whole community and uh, you know, giving people a place to discuss things and, and mount events and, and do meetups or, you know, whatever it is that uh, matters to them in, you know, the, all around the calendar, not just uh, when the conference is happening. Great. So I have a question here, and there was still a question in the back, so we have only about five minutes. Let's start um, here. Sorry, I think you were first, but <laughs> for efficiency's sake. And these will I'm, be the last I'm time. sorry. I That's didn't okay. mean to. Um, and it's a very quick comment. Um, not to be nostalgic, but um, that camp was a very good, for its time, it was a perfect idea because it was always very local and it was an unconference. So you can do your own. But the other thing is, to, yes, also to, to develop your own regional. So um, in the 
we, we, I'm not boasting about it, but because I had nothing to do with it, but Chesapeake, so grouping the University of Virginia, George Mason, um, University of Maryland, and just to get together, even virtually, I think is, is a really good idea regionally. So just chiming in, in a way. Great. Thank you very much for that. And over by the door. Yeah, there is, uh, uh, I think, adho at adho.org is a working email address. Um, and th there is contact information on the website. I believe that's the best email address. Please. Yeah, um, yeah, I guess I should have said in the front if I wanted to yeah, um, be um, called earlier. Um, so uh, my question connects to things that have already been said, but I was just wondering in terms of this conference and the hybrid nature of it going forward, if there are any plans or if that's a priority or a concern in terms of the remote participation, because I know that this morning there was some controversy around that. And so I was just wondering um, what your plans are in the future, if you have any um, already at the moment for that. For remote participation? Michael, yeah. One, two. So I'm, um, yeah. Michael Sinatra, the chair of the conference coordinating committee. Um, yes, we've seen that. And in some ways, there's questions, obviously, of um, fees and the practicality of each local organization host. So we're always, from one year to another, striving to be more inclusive in different ways. Um, this year, it was participants who could be actively sharing their papers and having a text-based uh, version. And we're looking at different ways how in the future we can continue to be more inclusive by having different strive of fees potentially for people to be actively participating remotely but or to be actively viewing remotely at a much lower you know, fees so that they could be even more inclusive in that sense. And as you already know, being here, every session is being recorded, will be made available to everybody who paid their fees, but eventually will be made available to everybody around the world for free, um, you know, all the sessions, uh, every single papers. So it's, it's one of the constraints of balancing out the cost, and technology varies drastically from one country to another, and what can be sort of uh, made available. So we're certainly taking information in strides, and the LOs have been wonderfully, you know, active and trying to sort of do their best with that. Every room, as you've noticed, has two participants monitoring the chat and trying to be making sure that there is, you know, an engagement in conversation there. Um, it just was not feasible pragmatically and, and financially to have a full you know, Zoom participant remotely uh, by others. Um, so it's, it's trying to find that uh, sweet spot, shall we say. Uh, but certainly, as we revise the conference protocol, it's become now compulsory for future hosts to uh, mention hybridity and what they're going to be doing. So on Friday, you'll hear from our colleagues in Washington for the DH 2024 host about you know, some of their plans. And you'll also find out about the DH 2025 host at that moment and what you know, some of their plans will be in the future. But that's something that has been, as Christoph mentioned, updated in a conference protocol when we do call for bits. So more versions of what would hybridity you know, be really meaning for people in different ways you know, around the world. Thanks, and thanks for that comment. Uh, I think we should uh, give people a break and let them come in and set up. So I thank you all for your participation and your questions, and thanks to our presenters. Thanks.